The periodic table, we'll provide a brief introduction to it here in this lesson. Uh, this is the second lesson in a chapter on atoms, molecules, and ions. And uh, we just talked about atomic theory and atomic structure. And after this lesson, we'll be moving into naming compounds, aka nomenclature. Uh, but in the meantime, we got to really introduce this periodic table. guy named Mendeleev really kind of was the father of this. And truth be told, we've got a lot of elements on this thing that Mendeleev had never heard of. So, and not even just these big ones, and I'm missing a few here. This one, this thing's a little bit old here. So, but we're, we've got pretty much all the way through atomic number 118 uh, discovered at this point. At least we think we do. Sometimes they'll add some and then they pull them back off and like, did we discover it? I don't know. Because some of these big ones, uh, they don't exist for very long when they make them in a lab. So we're not going to find them in nature and stuff like this. So, but even some of the ones up here, there were elements that hadn't even been discovered in Mendeleev's time, but he set up this table in a very methodical way. There's a very good structure to this thing. And he could predict that certain elements probably existed. We just hadn't discovered them yet. So it was actually quite the amazing feat he pulled off in this regard. Now, this thing is organized by atomic number. So if you notice, we go from atomic number one on hydrogen to atomic number two with helium to atomic number three with lithium, then beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, just with increasing atomic number as we go down. So you'll also find out that generally, there's a couple exceptions, but generally you'll see the atomic mass increasing as we go as well, but it's specifically that atomic number, which as you recall from the last lesson corresponds to the number of excuse me, the number of protons so uh, that this is organized by. Now, a couple things you should know here. So once again, this guy right here is the atomic number. So it's usually written right at the top of the element symbol, and it could be in the center, it could be off the left or right, So, but it's usually written at the top. So we've got the atomic mass down below, and that's its normal spot as well. And then we've got the element symbol. So, and as I mentioned in the last lesson, you should really probably work on memorizing the elements that correspond to at least the first 30 element symbols. So, and again, I don't think you have to know that atomic number 30 is zinc. For most of you guys, that's not gonna be something that's gonna be required of you. But knowing that ZN stands for zinc, so that CU stands for copper, that FE stands for iron, which is one of the unusual ones with the Latin root. So that's probably worth your time up through the first 30 elements here. Now, cool. Now they call this the periodic table. So when you think of something that's periodic, something that happens periodically, you might think of the sun rising. It happens on a cycle, happens every 24 hours, so to speak. So the periodic table is called periodic for a reason. So it turns out that elements that are in the same column often have similar chemical properties. So, and as a result, we call these groups. We want to group together so elements with chemical, chemi similar chemical properties. So uh, in this case, again, the columns are groups, but it turns out the rows are gonna be called periods. And the idea was this, so let's say we got these guys here called the noble gases, by the way. So helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. So if we look, turns out they're super unreactive. That's kind of their, their key characteristic. They do almost no chemical reactions. So the small ones definitely do none, and even some of the bigger ones do only a handful of chemical reactions. So they're known as being what we call chemically inert. And so if you look, as you go across the periodic table, boom, you hit something that's chemically inert, and then boom, you hit something that's chemically inert. And then you keep increasing by atomic number and boom, you hit something that's chemically inert. And periodically, you keep coming across something that's chemically inert in this case. But you keep periodically coming across something with similar chemical properties, similar, similar chemical behaviors. And so that's, again, one why we call the columns groups. And then we call the rows periods. And you should definitely know those. But that's where we get the name periodic table of elements because periodically you run into you know elements with similar chemical properties. All right, some of these groups you definitely need to know and some of the divisions here and stuff like this. And so uh, the one I gave you on your handout kind of shows you a couple different versions anyways, that there's really like a red staircase that runs through a lot of periodic tables right here. And it separates the metals from the non-metals. And then a handful right along the staircase here are what we call metalloids. And they're kind of like have properties of both metals and non-metals. So most of the elements are metals, all the ones over here. So notice sodium over here is a metal, potassium is a metal, iron's a metal, chromium's a metal, so on and so forth. But there are far fewer non-metals over, you know, and we've got like nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, those are all non-metals. And then again, a few right along the border are called metalloids or semi-metals sometimes. So we got boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium. Those are kind of your classic metalloids. 
Cool, and so that's one way we can look at the division uh, of the periodic table. So, but there's also four groups that you probably just should know the name of. So the first group here, so we don't include hydrogen because hydrogen actually is a non-metal, it really belongs over here. So, but based again on how this is structured according to Mendeleev, we put it here. Uh, but from lithium on down, these are all metals and we call them the alkali metals. And that's the name of the group, we call this group one since it's the very first column. They're the alkali metals. So, and I kind of die, you know, put that in the diagram on your handout because it's worth knowing. So they're the alkali metals. Now alkali, it turns out means basic. And when I say basic, I don't mean like, well, it's just basic, you know, basic chemistry, Chad. It's not actually what I mean. I mean like acidic versus basic. And the reason is if you put any of these in water, one, they're going to react violently with water and even more violently as you go down, it's kind of a weird thing. So, and they're going to turn the water into a highly basic solution. The pH is going to go up above seven pretty significantly. So that's why they call them the alkali metals. Cool. Group two here, the next column over, these are also fairly reactive with water, not quite as reactive as the alkali metals, but they also form basic solutions. And so they call these the alkaline earth metals, alkaline earth metals. Cool. Two more groups on the far end here. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, these are called the halogens. So, and then the noble gases we were introduced to a little bit earlier here, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. So, and those are the four groups that are worth knowing. Now there are some names for some of the others like oxygen's columns called the chalcogens, but nobody's ever gonna talk about that for the most part and things of this sort. So most of the other groups, not super important to associate any sort of name with them, but those four, the alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, halogens, noble gases, totally worth your time. So finally, we've got a couple other things to look at. And, We've got the metals right in the middle of the periodic table here, right from like scandium over to zinc in this box right here. These are called the transition metals. They get a lot of air time. They're usually uh, form brightly colored compounds and things of a sort. So, and then these guys down here, so some people call them the rare earth metals, but that's not really the best name because there are some up here that might be considered rare earth too. But these are the lanthanides and actinides. So, but those names are not super important and you're probably not gonna study the lanthanides and actinides to any significant degree. Uh, you know, not unless you uh, decide to be a chemistry major and, and take an advanced course in inorganic chemistry as possibly a senior or even graduate student uh, in college. Cool, but the transition metals, you definitely gotta identify those, but like if you notice on the on your the study guide there, I did not put the lanthanides and actides and not identify them. So, and that is their names, but it's just not super important at this level. Cool, and that's about the level of what you need to know regarding the periodic table. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, please consider giving me a like and a share. And if you're looking for the study guide that went with this or for some practice materials, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.